Welcome to lecture 5.1, Inner Products and Euclidean Structure. Up until now, much of our previous theory has been algebraic in flavor. What's been missing is a metric. In this section, we will study vector spaces where we also have a notion of the length of a vector. As a result, this part of the class will contain more analysis and less algebra. This is motivated by our regular Euclidean space Rn, where we have standard concepts such as length and angle. Now we've done a whole lot about vector spaces without using these concepts, but there's also a lot more that we can leverage once we introduce them. For example, we can speak of notions such as orthogonality, which is just a fancy word for something that's perpendicular. And using this, we can project vectors onto other vectors or onto subspaces. All of this, length, angle, orthogonality, projection, is made possible by the dot product, something that we all know and love. Up until now, we've probably seen this written as x dot y, like this. Though going forward, we will write it with angle brackets, like this. Though I will often still say x dot y, because dot is a very convenient verb in this context. And we know how this is defined. You take the n-tuples of the vectors and just multiply the corresponding entries and add them up. And the reason why this works, why the dot product has all this power, is because it is a symmetric bilinear form with one additional property that we will get into pretty shortly. In this section, we will abstract the notion of the dot product to a more general concept called an inner product, which will be any symmetric bilinear form with this additional property that we will see shortly. Throughout this lecture, and probably many other lectures in this section, we will assume, unless specified otherwise, that x is an n-dimensional vector space over the real numbers. Now, a lot of this is going to hold for other vector spaces, like those over finite fields, but what we don't want are vector spaces over the complex numbers. And the reason for that is because these properties, um, such as being symmetric and being bilinear, are going to have to be generalized in those settings. In particular, the inner product in a complex vector space is not going to be symmetric, but it will be what's called conjugate or Hermitian symmetric. So if you swap the order, you've got to put a complex conjugate on top. And similarly, bilinear, um, if you pull out, so you, you'll be able to pull out a constant from the first coordinate, but if you want to pull out a constant from the second coordinate, it's going to have to be a complex conjugate. And so this is called sesquilinear. So the reason why, just as a quick preview, the reason why these things are required is because the norm of a complex number is, is not z squared. Uh, sorry, the norm squared is not z squared, but instead it is z times z bar. So it is a plus bi times a minus bi. So that's what precipitates these requirements. So we will be only working with real vector spaces in this lecture. Let's start with a quick crash course of Euclidean geometry, because that will highlight the objects and the features that we want to generalize to arbitrary inner product spaces. To begin, the length or the norm of a vector x, which we denote with these double absolute value bars, is just the distance from x to the zero vector. And when I say distance, I mean the Euclidean distance, like what we would measure with a ruler or tape measurer. And we do this with the Pythagorean theorem. The norm of x is just x1 squared plus x2 squared up to xn squared. And of course, these are the entries in x if you write it as an n-tuple. And notice that what we have under the square root here is really just x dot x. 
So in other words, the norm of x squared is just the dot product of x with itself. Since the dot product is symmetric and bilinear, if we take two vectors, x and y, and we compute x plus y dot x plus y, then we get x dot x plus 2 x dot y, this is by symmetry, plus y dot y. And that is just the norm of x squared plus 2 x dot y plus the norm of y squared. And of course, this is just the norm of x plus y squared by this relation right here. Likewise, if we subtract these two, then x minus y dot x minus y is x dot x minus 2 x dot y plus y dot y. And this is the norm of x squared minus 2 x dot y plus the norm of y squared. So it's almost the same as what we have up here. It's just we have a minus sign instead of a plus sign. And this is, of course, the norm of x minus y squared. Several remarks. First of all, all of this is independent of the choice of basis. In other words, it's independent of the coordinate system. Geometrically, we understand what the norm of x, the norm of y, and the norm of x minus y represent. So for example, if I draw a picture, say this is x, say this is y, then we have a triangle here. And the length of this side is norm of x, the length of this side is norm of y, and the length of x minus y is this right here. At, because x minus y is, is this vector right here. And we don't quite yet understand what x dot y is. Maybe you know, but I haven't mentioned it. And it's going to have something to do with this angle. So let's try to understand that. And to do so, we will pick a special x and y. Because what we've done so far does not depend on a choice of coordinate system. So let's take any basis or coordinate system defined by x1 up to xn. And let's pick x to be a scalar of x1. Then as an n-tuple, x is just has zeros everywhere except in the first coordinate where it's the norm of x. Now let's let y be in the span of x1 and x2. So in other words, if x1 looks like this, and maybe x2 is up here, then by construction, x is a scalar of x1, and maybe y goes off like this in the span. Now, I, I said that here, I started with the basis, and we pick an x and y, but we could just as easily do this in the other order. We could start with an x and a y that we wanted to understand, and let's let theta be the angle between them, and we could just declare x1 to be a scalar of x and x2 to be some vector so that y is in the span of those. And then we could extend that to a basis of x. So either of these constructions is fine. The point is that the geometry between x and y does not depend on the choice of basis. So we might as well pick a nice basis. So now by basic trig, if we take this vector y, this length down here is norm y times cosine of theta. And this height of this triangle is norm y times sine of theta. So now if we take the dot product of x and y, we just get the product of these first two terms. So x dot y is norm x times norm y times cosine of theta. So we can now characterize the angle theta based on the dot product. So in other words, if since x dot y is norm x, norm y, cosine theta, we solve for cosine theta here. And of course, if you prefer, we can write this as theta equals the arc cosine of x dot y over norm x times norm y. And I have a slight pet peeve about writing inverse cosine like this um, because 
for all other powers of cosine, we it's standard to write cosine, you know, so cosine squared of x is cosine of x squared, and in cosine to the k of x equals cosine of x to the k for all powers, except if we put, we put a negative one here, in which case it's, oh, it's, it's arc cosine. So I think this is a terrible inconsistency of notation, especially in calculus when we're trying to tell students that, you know, we, we have a consistent and sensible notation when we don't. So I will always use arc cosine instead of inverse cosine like this. And also, I don't know if it'll come up, but I will prefer to write cosine of x to the k instead of cosine k of x. Moving on, we can also derive the law of cosines simply from the dot product. Let me draw a picture for that. So it's going to be similar to one that we saw before. So if this is a vector x and this is a vector y, I'm going to write the actual lengths of them instead of the vectors themselves. Then this, this is theta, and then this, of course, has norm x minus y. And remember from the previous slide that the norm of x minus y squared is the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared minus 2 times x dot y. Now in this picture, uh, the standard law of cosines is written where this, let's call this a, norm of x is a, norm of y is b, so this is a squared plus b squared and minus so now we know that this is, if x dot y, we, we can, if we solve for it up here, that that is 2 norm x times norm y. And this is, c is the length of this side here. So this is our standard law of cosines that we learned back in, I think it was trigonometry. One important remark to make is that if we want to generalize Euclidean space, and because that's what we want to do. We want to replace this dot product with an arbitrary inner product and have everything go through as before. We absolutely need that the cosine of theta is between negative 1 and 1. And so the, this quantity here, we know that the cosine of theta is between negative 1 and 1 for the dot product. In other words, this quantity x dot y over norm x times norm y for the dot product is between negative 1 and 1, but we have to prove that for any symmetric bilinear form with that extra special property is going to satisfy this as well. This is guaranteed by the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, which says that for all vectors x and y in Rn, the absolute value of x dot y is less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. Notice that this is equivalent to say that x dot y divided by norm x times norm y is less is between negative one or negative one and positive one. Uh, moreover, equality holds if and only if these are scalar multiples of each other. So th this does not have an easy follow your no nose proof, as far as I know. So the proof I'm going to sh show you, it takes a little bit of a magic bullet out of left field, but once we have that, it's fairly straightforward. So I will define a function q from r to r, and q of t is going to be the norm of x plus t y squared, which of course is non-negative. Now let's think about what this represents. So if this is the origin and this is this is x and say y is, is some vector out here, then the norm of x plus t squared measures, so it's so start with x and go in the y direction indefinitely, and this measures the square this measures how far we are from the origin as we go along that path. Well, it's the, the square of, of that distance. So it starts at norm x and it just gets bigger and bigger. So let's first of all assume that y is non-zero because 
Otherwise, it's, it's trivial. Just, you can just check that, obviously, equality holds if y is 0. And let's write q of t. So I'm going to write q of t to be the norm of x squared plus 2t times x dot y plus t squared times the norm of y squared. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a certain value of t that's going to make this behave very nicely. So I'm going to let t be equal to, so I'm going to plug in the value for t, which is x dot y divided by norm of y squared. So I'm going to plug that in for here, and let's, let's see what, what we're going to get. So we get the norm of x squared plus 2 times, so this, this thing that I'm going to plug in, negative x dot y over norm y squared times x dot y, x dot y, plus, now the square of this is x dot y squared divided by y to the fourth times y squared. So I've so I plugged t squared in here and t in for here. And now remember that well let's let's first of all let's simplify this and see what happens. Um, that's that's the next step. So we have the norm of x squared and now this x, this y squared, norm y squared will cancel with this norm y to the fourth, and we'll get norm y squared on the bottom. And so let, let me write that. Let me cancel that and put a 2 right there. And now these two things will s somewhat cancel. So look what we have. We have, we have a x dot y squared over norm y squared, one of those things here, and negative two of those things here. So that will reduce down to negative x dot y squared divided by norm y squared. And I claim that that, that is, oh, I've already said that that is greater than or equal to 0. And that's actually all we need. So note, I, notice that that is equivalent to this. If you don't quite see that, let's, let's simplify this. So now we get norm of x squared greater than or equal to x dot y squared divided by norm y squared. And now we can simplify this as norm x squared times norm y squared is greater than or equal to um, x dot y squared. And if you take the square to both sides, you got to put an absolute value sign here. And that's exactly what we have right here. So that verifies this thing. And then um, I'll leave it as an exercise to show that equality holds if and only if x and y are scalar multiples of each other. That's, that's not hard. That's basically because x dot y is the norm of x times the norm of y times the cos cosine of theta. So the only time, so the only time you're going to get 1 here is when theta is equal uh, is it equal 0 or pi over 2. So in the first case, we have something like this, and the next case, we have something like, like that. Next up, we have the triangle inequality, which says that for all vectors x and y in Rn, the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. So that makes sense with picture why it should be true. If we have two vectors, let's say one of them is x. So this is the length of this is norm x. The length of this is norm y. And we add them up. Then the length of this side is norm x plus y. And of course, this is going to have, this can't be bigger than the sum of these two things. If it were, we would somehow have a picture like this, which is obviously absurd, where we have an 
my X here and a Y here, and these things wouldn't be able to, to reach. Now, I want to make one comment about this, is that if you've studied real analysis, um, well, the fundamental object is a metric space. And in a metric space, we have a, a set X and a distance function, distance function D, for go, going from X to the non-negative, or I should say the yeah, that's right. The, the non-negative real numbers that, that satisfies some basic properties. So x of x, any the distance from any point to itself better be zero. The distance from x to y has to be the distance from y to x. And then the third condition that ha has to hold is the triangle inequality. So in the study of metric spaces, you take the tri the triangle inequality as an axiom. It says any sensible distance function is going to have to satisfy that. And then you see what you can prove about these so-called metric spaces. And Rn is a metric, well, I should be specific, there's a number of metric spaces you could define on Rn, depending on what the distance function is. Now, some metric spaces, the distance between x and y to points, now I should call these points, is the standard Euclidean distance. You could also define it as the so-called taxicab distance. So if you were in a city and you wanted to travel from two, between two buildings, you'd have to go along uh, street blocks. So that, that, that's another distance function you could travel you define. A somewhat seemingly silly distance function is you could always just say that the distance between any two points that are not the same is equal to 1. And that actually does satisfy the triangle inequality. And, and there's actually real-world applications where that metric comes up. And there, there's many other metrics that one could define as well. But in real analysis, you, you study, when you study metric spaces, you take this as, as a, an axiom. And then you, not long after that, prove the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. What we're doing now is the opposite. We are saying, let's, let's take a vector space. And there, and now from the vector space, we have a notion of distance. Um, so we can prove the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and it follows pretty easily that the triangle inequality follows as well. Now, for a metric space, we don't have any vector space structure to begin with. We just have a set and a distance function. So I just want to compare and contrast. We're doing things a little bit differently than maybe you've seen, but that's because we have different objects that we are looking at and different assumptions going in. Okay, uh, finally, one quick corollary about the triangle inequality is that, that for any vector x, its norm is simply the maximum value of the dot product of all unit vectors with x. So a, a way to visualize this is if this is like three-dimensional space and you have some say vector x out here, then you can take you know, all these other vectors on, on the unit circle. So if, if I take this vector and I take the, the dot product of y with x, what I will get is, is I will get this length. So the dot product, as we will see in the next lecture, represents, it can be thought of as a, a way to project vectors onto other vectors. Um, for now, I will assume that because it's something you probably are familiar with from your vector calculus or just previous geometry days. So um, in other words, if you want the norm of x, what you can do is you can project all possible vectors on x. And obviously, the, the one that's going to give you the, the largest value is going to be the y, which is just a scalar multiple of x. And so notice that x dot y, in this case, is the norm of x times the norm of y times the cosine of theta. And now I am saying maximum. Some An analyst might look at this and say, you know, should I be saying this supremum, which if you don't, we'll talk about this later in this section. If you don't know what this is, this is the, the least upper bound, um, which sometimes you have to define because you don't, aren't necessarily guaranteed that the maximum will exist. It's like saying 
the, the largest negative number is there isn't one, but zero is the, is the least upper bound over all negative numbers. However, by this characterization, we know that there is a, um, a vector that if we take x to y to be a scalar of x, then the cosine of, of theta is just going to be 1. And so, and for all other vectors y that are not scalars, this is going to be less than 1, and this maximum is not going to be achieved. So this is just a convenient way to describe the norm of a vector, and we'll use this later. Now, as long promised, we are ready to generalize the dot product. Remember why we want to do this. The dot product on Rn gives us a notion of length. The norm of a vector x is just the square root of x dot x. That's the Pythagorean theorem. And gives us a notion of angle. Cosine of theta is just x dot y divided by norm x times norm y. There's nothing special about the dot product other than it's a symmetric bilinear form and that additional property that I promised I'd tell you about is that it's positive definite, which means that for any non-zero vector x, if you take the dot product of x with itself, you get a positive number. And that's because the norm of any vector that's non-zero has to be strictly positive. And when I say there's nothing special about this, I mean there's also nothing special about base 10. There's nothing special about standard Euclidean, say, compared to hyperbolic geometry. It's just things that we are used to that we don't really question, but mathematically underneath the scene, scenes, the basic properties that we know and love can be generalized. And that brings us to a definition. An inner product on a real vector space x is a symmetric positive definite bilinear form, that is, it's a function from x cross x to r, and I might write it like this with angle brackets and two blank entries. A vector space endowed with an inner product is an inner product space. Sometimes we Sometimes you may hear it as a Euclidean space or a generalized Euclidean space, though I prefer just an inner product space. The key point is that everything we've done thus far, our interpretation of length and angle, the law of cosines, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the triangle inequality, proposition or corollary 5.1, etc., works for general inner product spaces. There is nothing special about the dot product. And I encourage you to pause this lecture and go back and check. You know, one reason why I use the notation, this angle bracket notation instead of x dot y is to, so at this point you could go back and verify that everything carries through for general inner product spaces. Let's finish by exploring some examples and see what works and what doesn't work. Let's finish this lecture by exploring some examples of inner product spaces to see what works and what doesn't. We'll start with R2, where the inner product is defined as follows. So if I let x be the vector a1, a2, and y be the vector b1, b2, then I'm I'm going to declare that x, the inner product of x and y, is, is y transpose times this matrix 2, 1, 1, 2 times x. So I, and so I can write that as the, the dot product of y with, let's call this matrix A times x. So let's, let's see what what the norm and angle is in, in this vector, inner product space. And when I say that, I mean, let's, let's just do a few examples. So let's take E1 and E2. So, so E1 is 1, 0, and E2 is 0, 1. 
So the, the norm of E1 is, I guess the norm squared of E1 is E1 dot itself. So this is 1, 0 times 2, 1, 1, 2 times 1, 0. So this is, let's see, 1, 0 times, uh, what's this vector? This is vector is 2, 1. And so that's, that's going to be 2. So our, our so-called standard unit basis vectors don't have norm 1 anymore. They, they have norm um, root 2. So in other words, norm of E1, it's easy to check that this is going to be the norm of E2, is actually equal to root 2. Now let's, let's check what the, what the angle between these vectors is. So the, the cosine of theta is x dot y divided by norm x times norm y. So let's compute this. Well, first of all, the, the bottom of this is going to be 2, right? Because So this is going to be 1 half times norm x or x dot y. So that is 1 half times, it's going to be a similar computation. Um, so we're going to put y right here. So let's, let's, the order probably doesn't matter as long as we're consistent. 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2 times 1, 0. And this is 1 half times 0, 1 times, see this is a 2 on the top and a 1 on the bottom. So this is going to be um, 1 half times, this is, is just 1, is, is 1 half. So whatever this angle is, the, the, the cosine of it is 1 half. So normally, in standard Euclidean geometry, we would expect the cosine of this angle to be 0 because it's 90 degrees. And let's think about what, uh, I'll go back to the unit circle, what angle do we expect to have cosine of 1 half, or what angle does have cosine of 1 half, I should say. So that's going to be like a 60 degree angle. So 60 degree angle is 1 half and root 3 over 2. So your standard unit basis vector, in other words, the x and the y axis, um, in with respect to this inner product, make a 60 degree angle with each other. So perhaps it's wrong of me to actually draw it like this to give the impression that they're at 90 degrees. Basically, think of x as an abstract vector space, um, two-dimensional vector space where E1 and E2 is a basis, but they, um, the inner product is such that these vectors are at 60 degrees. Um, I encourage you to explore this more, to try other, you know, see what the, these, say the line y equals x and y equals negative x are, uh, see what angle they make with each other and with the x and y axes. And we will return to this example in the next lecture when we study orthogonality. Now, being orthogonal, uh, vectors being orthogonal is the analog to them being perpendicular, as we will see. Two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero. So it's, it's an interesting question to ask what vectors or what lines in this inner product space have inner product zero. So more on that later. Our next example is the same underlying vector space, R2, but now our inner product is defined with the matrix 1, 2, 2, 1 instead of 2, 1, 1, 2. So let's take x equals, let's take 1, negative 1, and let's compute its norm. So I'll actually do the norm squared of x, which is x dot x. And so this is 1, negative 1 times 1, 2, 2, 1 times 1, negative 1. Here I think it's easier just to use this definition, and we can see a1, b1 is equal to 1, so that's, that's 1, uh, a1, b2, and a2, b2 are negative 1, so that's 1 minus 2 minus 2 plus 1, and that's negative 2. 
So that's not possible. A, a vector cannot have a norm of negative 2. So this does not work because this inner product is not positive, or this, this attempt at an inner product, this bilinear form is not positive definite. So it's worth thinking about what's the difference between this matrix and this one? Why did this one work and this one not work? Well, I'll give you a hint. This one down here has a negative eigenvalue, and this one up here has two positive eigenvalues. Once again, more on this later. Our next example is something that we've seen when we studied bilinear forms. So it's this sort of twisted inner product where we have a1, a2, dot b1, b2. You know, normally with the dot product, we multiply across a1, b1, plus a2, b2, but here we're doing it in sort of a twisted fashion. We're doing a1, b1, minus a2, or plus a2, b1. So it's not clear how to write this in terms of a matrix, but I claim this is also not going to work because if we, for the same reason, if we take x, let me get a different color here, if x equals 1, negative 1, then x dot x is going to be, using this formula, is, is going to be negative 2 once again. So this does not work. And if you play around with this a little bit, you'll see that this definition can actually be written in terms of a matrix as well. In fact, it's 0, 1, 1, 0. And indeed, this matrix has a negative eigenvalue. So again, more on this later. Our next example is the space of linear maps from x to y. And let's say that x is n-dimensional and y is m-dimensional. And we're going to define the inner product of a and b as the trace of b transpose a. And I claim that that is just the sum of the corresponding products of the entries, sort of like the dot product, but a two-dimensional version of that. And let's think about what this looks like. So if, if this is a and this is b, so this is a and b transpose. So a is m by n and b is n by m. And now if we take, now we are multiplying the, the rows of B transpose times the columns of, of A. And if we think about what these entries are, this, this first one is, is B11 plus B21 plus BM1A11A21 A1, up to AM1. So when we multiply this row times this column, what we're going to get in, in that, this is the upper left entry, is A11, B11 plus A21, B21 plus all the way up to A, M1, B, M1. And this is that first, and then we get these diagonal entries, and when we add those up, notice what we are doing is we are, again, multiplying the the AIJ entry with the BIJ. So this space, remember, um, the dimension of the space is n times m. And we can think of, you know, vectors in here are nm tuples, or just for a general nm dimensional space. And you can really think of these, these matrices as being like a vector of size nm, but they're just arranged a little differently. So they are arranged in n columns of, of, of m entries. So this, this really is no different, you know, mathematically than just um, defining the standard inner product in an nm dimensional space of, of vectors. Finally, our last example comes from an infinite dimensional space of continuous functions on an interval a, b, and we will define the inner product of f and g to be just the integral of f times g over that interval. So this may seem like a little bit of a weird definition, but if you think about it, you know, what is 
a standard dot product. The standard dot product is just the sum of, say, x i times y i from i equals 1 up to n. And th this is a discrete sum of n things. You're multiplying the two vectors component by component. Well, what's the continuous version of, of a sum? It's an integral. So the continuous version of this really is like multiplying the functions f and g point by point over the entire interval. So this is, this is f, and this is f, and, and maybe this is g. So you multiply the product of these. This is f times g, and just compute the area under the curve. So this is a very common way to define an inner product on a space of functions. And there's a lot of variations. You know, for in some situations, sometimes you put a little weighting function w of x here. Or you can take a constant out front. Um, but we will see more of this later, especially in the next section when we talk about orthogonality. A really common example of, orth of orthogonal functions arises in differential equations and Fourier series. So that'll be a little bit beyond the scope of the class, but I think, or at least the technical details are because these are infinite dimensional spaces and there's issues with convergence and infinite sums that we don't have in finite dimensional spaces. But they are important enough um, that it is absolutely worth at least taking a high level tour of that. So that is what we will do in the next lecture along with orthogonality. So stay with us.